Hi, I'm Tobias Carlyle. This is the Aquarius Podcast. My special guests, guests today are Steve Bishop and Patrick Fisher of Elite Wine and Whiskey. We're going to be talking about storing and investing in wine and whiskey right after this. Tobias Carlyle is the founder and principal of Aquarius Funds. For regulatory reasons, he will not discuss any of the Aquarius Funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Acquires Funds or affiliates. For more information, visit AcquiresFunds.com. Steve, uh, can you tell me a little bit about Elite Wine and Whiskey? What is it? Hi, uh, thanks for having us today. Um, yeah, basically, Elite Wine and Whiskey is uh, a small company based in London. Uh, we pretty much help customers, uh, collectors uh, to purchase fine wine uh, and whiskey casks. Uh, a lot of our customers are predominantly collectors. Uh, they have a, a passion for, for alcohol. It's, it's something that's it's an interest to them. It's something that they they sort of uh, have an understanding and, and uh, enjoy the market. Uh, and more so recently, it's, it's been a, a lot of whiskey uh, collecting, which has been something that's become a, a huge part of, of our company, over, especially over the last 18 months. There's been a, a lot of talk uh, around whiskey casks. Uh, there's been, uh, it's been on the news. People have understood how, how well it's actually done. And I think because of the, the pandemic with, with COVID, people have I've been looking outside your normal remit area as well. So we've, we've had a lot of inquiries and, and uh, a lot of new customers have, have come on board with us over the last couple of years. So you're, you're the investment grade wine specialist between, between you and Patrick, who focuses more on the whiskey. Uh, yep. Can you just tell me a little bit about how, what's the process for investing in wine with you? How does that work? So on the wine side, we deal with what we would call as fine wine, which takes up sort of 0.2% of the actual annual growth of, of production of wine. Um, there's something, uh, a, a law called Appellation Contra, which allows chateaus, uh, especially more so in Bordeaux, where we predominantly uh, focus our attention. Uh, Appellation Contra only allows these chateaus in France to produce a certain amount of wine each year. So dependent on the weather, dependent on the, the, the grape and the harvest that year, then of course, uh, wines get uh, graded from different critiques. Um, if they have scores of anywhere really sort of over 90 and above, that's where we sort of pay our attentions. Um, there's a growth in system in Bordeaux as well. So you have your, your first growth, um, which is made up of five wines, big wines like Latour, Defeat Rothschild, Mousse and Rothschild. And then the, the tiering system goes down. So really, we would say that the, your Bordeaux, your, your, your Premier Cruise, your big wines are your, your safe bets where a lot of people would focus their attentions. But it doesn't mean that every year is going to be a good year. Of course, some years, if, if the weather isn't great and they haven't been able to, to produce the best of stock, then of course, it's a year that we won't focus our attention on. We might sort of pay our attentions elsewhere to maybe uh, Italy, uh, Rome, California, uh, and just basically try and keep our finger on the pulse to make sure that we're giving our customers the, the best chance to make good capital growth on their, on their money, basically. What's the, uh, what's the California wines that, uh, that you watch? Uh, California has been interesting over the last couple of years, really, really interesting. And it's actually been quite hard to call uh, because I, I love California wine. I think basically... Bordeaux wine is, is very heavy. Um, it's, it's, it's number one, basically. Bordeaux, France are, are known for, for having the, the most amazing wines. But California, I think they've done really well with their marketing over the last couple of years as well. And, and because it's a slightly lighter wine, mostly made up of Cab Sav, um, I think with the, with the way they've, they've marketed themselves, they've tried to tap into the younger audience, which I think they've done extremely well. A lot of their wine bottles and the labels are quite quirky, something that's slightly different. Um, but it's been hard to call because, of course, we've had a lot of bad weather in California over the last couple of years as well. Uh, we've had a, we've had the horrific scenes with the, the the fires. Of course, there's been a lot of droughts over there, so it's it's been difficult. And the fact of that, it's actually sometimes improved great quality on the fact of that the the, dra uh, the grapes actually drying out, but also at the same time, it's limited the amount of production they could do as well. Um, and there's been certain wines where we put our customers into to big stock like uh, Screaming Eagles, Highland Estates, Opus Ones, uh, Dominus, 
real, real big hits in California ones, but not all of them has, have performed as well as we would have liked, which is, which is quite strange. But we're members of something called LiveX, which is a main trading platform for fine wine. And there was a recent article basically saying that California wine is now taking up nearly 17% of trade. So it's, it's, it's taken up more uh, of people's interest. And I think it's something that I think if people looked at it as a, a longer hold, a five, 10 year hold in the Californian, they would do extremely well. How did you uh, get started as, uh, as a wine guy? Okay, so I, without sounding like an alcoholic, I, I enjoy my alcohol. Uh, I, I like I like wine. I, I like whiskey. Since meeting Pat, I've I've been fortunate enough to try some fantastic whis- whiskies, and and we've travelled to Scotland a couple of times, and and had some amazing experiences. I I've, I think as a, an individual, I I have an interest in like property. I have an interest interest in in sort of cars. Um, I, I like tangible assets things that you can collect things that you can actually touch and feel and i've always have found that with with wine there's a there's a lot behind it there's a lot with whiskey that goes on behind the scenes there's a lot of heritage uh, it has a story to it it's it's, it's exciting there's, there's a lot there so I, I used to be involved in property um and i had some some friends that uh, introduced me to, to wine it's something now i've been involved in the last 15 years um, and I just really enjoy it. It's something that you can share with friends and you can, there's a lot of conversation all the time. And me and Pat have many, many, many conversations over, over wine, over whiskey. And it's something that you can celebrate with friends and it, it will always be at your tables, at your celebrations. It's, it's, it's something that, that I enjoy talking about. And Pat, uh, in, in whiskey, how, how, how did you first get started in it? Is it a birthright uh, because you're Scottish? <laughs> Um, yeah, basically, you're just taught it at school. It's, it's just part of your, your pathway into growing up through teenage years. Um, here's your choice. Be a fireman, a postman, or enjoy whiskey. Um, no, it's just, just one of those things that um, I sort of got pulled to. Uh, when I first graduated university, I went to work for uh, the world's largest brewer, uh, InBev, um, who owned Budweiser, Stella, Beck's Whole Garden. Um, and then progressed into uh, distilling. Um, and then obviously with the natural pool to Scotland and uh, understanding distilling and putting together products and some of the pains that distilleries have to go through, which, you know, it's hand craftsmanship making whiskey. Um, sort of then just sort of uh, fell, not fell into it, but found my pathway into whiskey and, and being able to have a, a nice life where I get to spend a couple of weeks each month up in Scotland and seeing my family and also have my life down in England with my own family and um, enjoy, you know, having a foot in both camps, if you like. Um, and that's that's how I got started. Can you give us an overview of what the sort of investment grade whiskey uh, world looks like? An incredibly diverse place. Um, where there is uh, an entry and access point for, for anybody that would look to invest in whiskey to, to generate a, a revenue back to them and profit or to do it as a passion with, with a love and a desire that they wanted to have their, their own cask of whiskey and bottle it for themselves. Um, it's such a dynamic, fast-moving uh, market right now, whiskey investment. You have a lot of... <sighs> A lot of distilleries are pulling back uh, their main name brands from the marketplace um, because they want to try and control uh, the the control the release of the product themselves. So they don't want it to end up in the hands of any old Tom, Dick, and Harry or independent bottlers who will release a different age expression or a different cask expression to what they would want to to have out in the market. Um, you have the other, the other continuous moving parts, um, which is you have got older brands that have been undervalued, um, finding their, their, new, their new fan base as they have had rebrands and then the value just, just suddenly shoots up overnight. Um, you have got this industry of whiskey, which you know, is hundreds of years old and distilleries that have stood there for you know, generations on generations which have now moved from being shrouded in secrecy 
to having the, the curtain pulled open and are now owned by huge multinational companies from the Diageos of the world to the Edrington groups of the world to the Nika whiskies of the world to the Pernod Ricards of the world and it has became an incredibly professional uh, business where every distillery is open in some way or another to the public where these, these global giants of companies are spreading the good word of whiskey near uh, all over the world, near and far. Um, and they are global monsters now. And that is part of why whiskey investment has become such a huge success for people. Um, and forgive me if I'm talking too much here, um, but it is the good news stories that you have seen on the BBC, Forbes, the Telegraph, the Times, the Mail, big mainstream publications, writing about people generating huge returns on their investments through whiskey and that has been driven by the professionalism that's been brought into the industry where these global companies have thrown billions of pounds at distilleries with 10 15 20 50 year projects in mind to generate the return on profit for all those billions and if companies like that are investing so heavily into the whiskey industry then they're not doing it to not generate profit for their shareholders. And of course, if you then get along and you buy a piece of that investment through a cask and not a share in the company, then you can pick up all that hard work that they're doing in rebrands, branding, selling to further afield, generating more new expressions, bringing new drinkers to the market. And you sit on that cask for five, 10, 15 years, you see the benefit of not just with whiskey, which is different to wine, where you can see on the internet or in a supermarket the difference between a 10-year-old bottle of, let's say, a Macallan versus a 25-year-old bottle, and you can judge the price gap, and you can see that over time on all the various outlets where you can buy whiskey. You can judge at which point you would want to sell it because you can see that price difference, and then you can track it across the years you own a cask with the year-on-year -year inflation that's put on with the year-on-year -year price increase. So most years, a distillery will release a 10-year-old expression, for example, of a whiskey, but it won't stay at the same price. The distillery will put an extra few pounds on the price of a bottle. And of course, that then is putting up the price of each and every different release, 18-year-old, 15-year-old, 20-year-old, as it kicks on further down the chain, which in turn means you can see, okay, if I buy this 10-year-old cask now and I sit on it for 10 years and it's released to the 20-year-old whiskey, I can see what that price increase would look like. But if you're sitting on it for 10 years, you have to then factor in. There will be inflationary in increases. You will then get the increase year on year from the distillery incre increasing the price of their bottle, which is obviously part of them investing into their business. They want to generate bigger profits. And of course, you might get lucky and get behind the brand, but um, one of the massive global companies takes and makes into something bigger than whiskey and makes it a brand itself, like Macallan has done with the Macallan, which is now viewed as similar terms as Rolex, Ferrari, Apple. Um, and you could pick something up that's undervalued and really cheap just now, but then as, you know, as we've seen with, and the most recent is I'm being Royal Brackla, which is owned by Bacardi. Beautiful whiskey, great whiskey. Nobody really knew too much about it. Didn't have great traction. Bacardi done an incredible rebrand that they worked on for three years. Released different expressions, different different age statements, different cask expressions, and the value of the same whiskey a year ago is almost 50% more in terms of just the bottle price from the new releases that they've done with Royal Brackler. Now everybody wants Royal Brackler and the value of casks doubled nearly overnight because as soon as the rebrand came out, everyone's like, God, that's amazing. And this new Sherry 18 year old expression is, how have I never known about Royal Brackler? Now I know all about Royal Brackler. And then of course, when they do these releases, they have plans to, uh, distribute it, you know, further afield in the Far East or America or, you know, big campaigns and duty free as and when travel returns to normal COVID. And that's certainly been seen with Royal Brackler. So 
that's a very broad brushstroke approach. And sorry if I have, uh, you know, bored you there with some of the some of the dynamics, I guess, of, of the whiskey market right now. But um, I hope that does give a, a, a good overall picture of what's happening in the whiskey investment market and, you know, why it has become such an exciting um, dynamic uh, place to be right now. Steve, um, there have been some attempts over the last few decades to, to like quantitatively predict what the value of a bottle will be over time because I understand that when you first drink, when the, if the wine is first cast, it's very raw and it's hard to kind of de determine even the very good ones, which will be the better ones. And so they've tried to come up with these other mechanisms for valuing these bottles. And it's, it's looking at the amount of rain that falls. Has that penetrated the industry at all? Do you, do you look at those things? Do you rely on them? Um, I think right, there's, a, there's a lot of critiques and there's, there's a, a handful that really sort of have a, a big, big influence on, on the wine market. Um, all wines are tasted from barrel to start with and, and given a, a, a rough score of maybe sort of, say, if it was out of 100, then, of course, they might taste the wine from barrel and say anywhere between sort of 90 to 93 points or 94 to 97 points and you can get a, a rough gauge. Um, there's been some exceptional years recently, uh, some not so ex exceptional years, and you do sometimes, I don't, I don't ever like to use the word punt because of course we do have people that buy wine because they enjoy the, 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 they don't just look at it as a money maker. They will look at it as, as something they're collecting. We've got a lot of our customers that might say, look, we'll, we'll take sort of three or four cases or something knowing that they, they'll sit on um, two cases for, for 10 years to sell and that the profit they've made will pretty much then pay for the first two. And the second two cases will be just, just, all profit um so it, it depends a lot a lot of our customers they, they look at it it's just uh, some of them are just as a bit of fun if i'm honest with you some of them it's just it's, it's a passion it's something they really enjoy they enjoy drinking wine um we've had uh, it's been ups and downs we, we follow a lot of things on livex as well livex is the main trading platform for fine wine so there's about 450 um, merchants that are members of LiveX globally. So that there's a lot of uh, buying and selling that goes on LiveX. We can track the indices. We can see what wines are selling more often than others. Uh, we can see what's popular. We can see if there's any bids, live bids on certain wines. So we can see daily what vintages what years are getting a more, lot more attention than others and we, we don't always get it right trust like we, we we try to always get it right we've, we've had certain wines and, and certain vintages that we've put customers money into and said look this this looks like it's going to do extremely well and it's been a little bit of a slow burner um some of them have taken a couple of years before there's been any real growth we might have seen a, a percent or two growth on an annual basis and it hasn't been as good as we wanted but there's been others where they've received scores they've received high scores and then they've been upgraded and then we We've seen sort of 10, 15, 20% uplift on, on annually. So we just have to keep our, our, our finger on the pulse as much as possible, really. Is there uh, a great deal of variability from vintage to vintage? Do they, are the better uh, winemakers able to sort of control it? Or is it, um, it really is dictated by the weather or whatever it is that prevails at the time. And, and then you don't really know what you've got for, you know 10 or 15 years or however long you're expected to to, to sell it i think if you stick with the big branded your bordeaux the Burgun burgundies have been absolutely phenomenal over the last sort of 10 15 years burgundies have done really 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 well if you if you was to purchase a, a, a case of say drc romani conti and you sit on it for the next sort of 10 15 years you, you're not really going to go too far wrong it's just inevitable it, you don't really get bad names with a, with a DRC. Um, if you buy, a, if you was lucky enough to, to get a Petrus where there's only sort of a few thousand cases made every single year and there's people on the waiting list to visit Petrus, if you get your hands on a Petrus, you know over time it's just going, going to do well. Of course, you can't keep these things for, the, these some of these wines for, for, for too long. Um, we've had stories where like Lafitte Rothschild 1982, it was at one point trading for sort of two, three hundred pound a case when it was first bought out in 1982. 
Um, Robert Parker, the most famous wine critique of all, uh, gave the Lafitte 82 100 points out of 100. Everyone said he was crazy. Um, it, it's not 100 point wine. And in 2010, the Lafitte Rothschild 1982 was actually trading for £50,000. Okay. But um, retraction on that, and then the score did come down to 98 points uh, out of 100. And the, the actual the, the wine now has started to come down slowly in value. So that £50,000 case has started coming down. It's, I think it's around about sort of 32, 33,000 pounds. So there is a, a right time to, to, to sell. You, you can overhold on, on wine as well, which is something that you, you don't send, you don't do with, with whiskey. With whiskey, you can just keep holding. Of course, there is a time when with the whiskey, we would recommend to, to actually bottle it um, before the ABV and the alcohol content comes down too low. But with wine, yeah, you, I'd say sort of a 10 year hold is, is a very, very good hold in wine. And you know, if you hold something for 10 years, you, you should be in good stead. Pat, uh, d does, does whiskey suffer from that same problem with the variability between the, the vintages or it, because it's, it's the process is so controlled that they're able to get much more consistency from year to year. I mean, you've hit a, you've hit the nail on the head right there. Um, as a much more controlled process these days, um, you know, 30, 40 years ago, there was more variation because it was so dependent upon the casks and where they were stored and what the bonded warehouse looks like and which part of the bonded warehouse they were in. And the climate, if Scotland suddenly had a hot summer evaporation rates would, would go up and, and, and various factors um, that all came into play before, you know, the, the big monster companies came and, and took over um, and brought in this degree and level of professionalism now, which gives the whole whiskey market the stability um, that it's always craved. Um, you know, the, there is, you can pick up a bottle of 25, 30 year old, 35 year old whiskey uh, from any of the main uh, distilleries and it will always within a, a varying degree taste the same um, and that is that is what has drawn more and more people to whiskey investment because with the big global companies owning uh, most of the major distilleries now in Scotland um, it's not only secured all the distilleries futures because um, they have been standing for hundreds of years and they are the 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 Diageos of the world, the Picardies, they are just treating them as custodians and passing them on. But they have invested heavily into cask programs so that the wood that's in the cask is, is the same throughout, whether it's bourbon barrels, port barrels, sherry barrels, uh, refill bourbon, virgin oak, which gives you the consistency. All the bonded warehouses now are all temperature controlled, so it doesn't matter which part of the bonded warehouse the casks are sitting in anymore. And it doesn't matter if the weather is suddenly really freezing cold for months on end, which is very typical in Scotland, or if it is suddenly swelteringly hot, you know that that cask is going to age at a certain rate and what the flavours will be. The education programmes has went into the master blenders and the master distillers and the warehouse keepers who are continuously going around sampling these casks to find out when they are at their prime that education ensures that you get that consistency now from the products and the tasting panels and the science that goes into it. You know, whiskey casks, it's not just 10 people now sitting around the table sampling it, agreeing, oh yeah, that, that tastes very similar to, to, what, to what it tasted like last year, right? So we'll release that. Um, you know, there is, you know, I've sat there around these tables and the scientific reports that are done on a cask of whiskey before it's bottled, testing for everything, any off flavors, testing testing for, is it matching the same scientific criteria that it matched last year? And if it does, then great, it makes the cut. And if it doesn't, then we'll send it off for it to be part of a blended whiskey rather than be this amazing single malt because they're so protective of what is released now and ensuring that they maintain the quality and consistency and a well-balanced product um, and I think that is part of what is continuing the rise and the growth of whiskey consumption around the world, attracting new people to the market because with these great cask programs that they've, that they've brought into play, they're able to ensure that when they do 
do a port barrel or when they do do a sherry barrel or when the master blenders and distillers come together and actually blend all three barrels together to release something really special or blend two together um that that product is is so accessible to everyone across the market um that it just keeps drawing in new and new drinkers and of course there is education of drinkers also and the growth of social media has allowed people to be able to do uh, the virtual tastings to find out what a product should or shouldn't taste like before they've even reached for it off the shelf. So that quality control has became so important. And the, as I spoke about earlier on, the sort of un, the drawing of the curtain to open up the distilleries to people to make it feel like they're part of that journey and part of that distillery. Um, continues to bring more and more people uh, sitting around the table, enjoying the end product. And that is where it's so different to wine with whiskey because it is more controlled. You, you can't open a, open a bottle of wine to see how it's tasting, but with a cask, they can continuously draw samples of year on year on year and make sure that it is aging appropriately, make sure that it is in its, in its absolute prime condition and with bottles of wine, that's a much harder thing to do. And obviously, you know, wine has its own experts and its own education behind it. But with whiskey, it, it's so professional and it is a much more protected um, way of checking year on year that that product is maintaining the highest uh, of conditions for the highest end quality product. If that if that deals with the question, perfectly. This is this is a question for both of you, but I, I, I'll start with you, Pat. To, to what extent is the value of a cask or a bottle driven by fashion or marketing or, or sort of taste at the time versus, say, the quality of the contents of the bottle? So the reason I ask is that it seems to me that the wine there can be these very good vintages that will be exceptionally uh, sought after and highly valued. Whereas for, for, for I gather from what you're saying about the, the whiskey that they, they make a concerted effort to revive a brand and bring it to everybody's attention. And that seems to be what drives some of the changes in valuation. Um, that's incredibly correct. There are, you know, as, um, as, as we've touched upon already, there are brands, all, all, all single malt whiskey that comes from a, a main distillery, um, a distillery that, that's sat there for you know hundreds of years. It's all a, a great product. And the reason it stood there for hundreds of years is because they have produced a wonderful, great product. Nowadays, they've removed any ambiguity of you know maybe having a bad 10%. Um, yes, fashion uh, brand managers um designers um you know chief executives play such a key role in you know bringing back a brand the a distillery that's there and it's producing whiskey and you know if you take an example like a balmanac or a royal brackler or a ben nevis all right so ben nevis great prime example um so there are the ben nevis is owned by nika and 70%, give or take, of the liquid that Ben, the whiskey that Ben Nevis makes, actually is shipped across to Japan and goes into Nika whiskey. Now, Nika whiskey is so well regarded. It's a really expensive product to buy. Whereas Ben Nevis, it's in the most beautiful location, the most beautiful setting. It's, it's got such an iconic name that's known worldwide, but yet it doesn't sell worldwide because it is, has been in a terrible bottle uh, is a distillery that before Nika has invested all this money, which they've been doing over the last two years, they've been investing heavily in the infrastructure of the distillery. You drive past the distillery now and it is beautiful sitting at the foot of Ben Nevis, whereas beforehand the paint was peeling off, it was a bit tatty, you know, it had an old management team in place from decades, decades beforehand. Um, and Nika has taken this baby, they've grabbed it and they have made the distillery incredible. They've set up a big viewing platform at the back of the distillery for people to take Instagram pictures of their experience, for example, and tag everyone in it. 
and they've built a beautiful tasting room that is it's built in granite it's granite and it's red leather and it's every Ben Nevis thing and there is a rebrand on the way with Ben Nevis um, and I've been lucky enough to sit in the offices of Ben Nevis see this new rebrand it looks fantastic but people have clocked on that Ben Nevis is going through changes Nika are investing into it there must be something going on in the background and the price has started to climb and now Soon the rebrand will be out. There will be different age expressions, different year expressions, um, and the the fashion behind it um, will change. So instead of 70% of that liquid going to Nika, they'll, they'll be pulling back some because they'll need it for themselves to release these different years, these different age expressions. Um, and it's the same with what's happened with Royal Brackla. Um, you know, as I said to you in, in one of the previous questions, the price of that for a cask nearly doubled overnight and the price of a bottle for the new expressions they were releasing for ages, that they for age expressions they hadn't released before and cask finishes they hadn't released before, that was almost 50% higher than some of the comparable older ones, but the older ones didn't have the fancy new label, didn't have all the PR drive behind it. Um, and that doesn't damage the value of pre-existing popular brands. Um, it just means that now there is a huge amount of marketing money suddenly behind this product, bringing it more into the public's consciousness, bringing it more into the public eye, bigger Instagram drives behind it, you know, more, more traffic online. And that inherently does push up the value of something that was undervalued. And there are still plenty of other brands out there, whiskey brands, that are currently undervalued, that are owned by the Pernod Ricards of the world, the Bacardis, the Diageos, where there is a lot of work going on in the background because there's a, there's a hole to fill in the whiskey market. There's more people drinking it than ever. It's growing year on year. There's a demand worldwide, but you can only get single malt whiskey, scotch from Scotland. There's only a finite amount of distilleries and so how do they increase their market share or how do they reach new territories or make the most of uh, whiskey they're producing already that might previously be used for blend? Well, years of investment into a rebrand, getting different expressions, different wood finishes ready, and then go out there and introduce this new all singing, all dancing rebrand to the world and the price just climbs up. And, and, and it's, it's a simple process but it probably would never have happened if it wasn't for the the bigger uh, the bigger worldwide organisations taking over the distilleries and bringing that professionalism. Mm. Because beforehand, all 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 prices were almost driven and dictated by the independent bottlers. Because the independent the distilleries, when they were all independently owned, were selling their balls to all the independent all the independent bottlers. You. Uh, Gordon and McPhail's of the world, your Hunter Langs, your Douglas Langs. Um, and they were so reliant upon that cash flow and that those revenue streams because it was those independent bottlers that had done the time developing the routes to market globally um, with their blended whiskies or their uh, single release expressions. And they determined if they released a 13-year-old Mortlach under Hunter Lang, and that was so popular and we're getting rave reviews, then that's what made, you know, Mortlach even more popular and more expensive. Um, and the independent bottlers done a lot of the promotional work for the distilleries. But the minute that you started to get that external investment from the bigger companies with their own marketing teams and their 10-year plans, then that's when it pulled back for the independent bottlers and you got the the smarter approach to the industry because they had the deeper pockets to invest into long-term projects and weren't almost living as hand to mouth as they had previously done. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's that in a nutshell. Yes. Fashion does drive it. Creativity, the marketing team rebrands, bringing more people's attention to a previously lesser thought of distillery does increase the drastically of that whiskey but it does not diminish the inherent growth going on with an already popular brand that you can see in the supermarket or see worldwide uh, i hope that that deals with that in a, in, a, in a good way that was great but so, steve same question to you because there was a i remember 
20 years ago, maybe there was a, uh, a documentary called Mondavino, which was about uh, Robert Parker's influence and perhaps promoting Mondavi as a, as a, you know, a comparable sort of wine to some of the European wines as an investment grade wine. Do, yep. And that sort of the, the suggestion in that documentary was that it was unfair for him to have sort of promoted it to that point. Do you, and I, I guess that's sort of, that's, that's an example of fashion, but I don't know, maybe the, it was just an undiscovered wine. Do you have any, do you have yeah, any views? I, I think where wine varies is, is different to the whiskey side, of course, as, as Pat touched on sort of rebrands and, and sort of people looking at sort of changing the, the path and the direction of, of different whiskey brands. I think with wine and the fact that we touched base on earlier, Appalachian Contrôle um, and the amount of wine they can produce each year, uh, and the fact of that you've also got the growth system in place. The, the growth system hasn't changed. It's it's well, I should say it hasn't changed. It changed once uh, over a hundred years ago, and it's pretty much sat and, and, and where it is now. So I think it's almost like these these chateaus have their stance already. Um, you, you know the lights of the Lafitte Rothschilds, you know the lights of Mouton Rothschilds, and you know that they're at the pinnacle. You, they, they know how good they are. Um, there is no difference in, in the wine labels from one year to the other. It literally just has the, the vintage on the bottle. Uh, there, there is no change. It's just a matter of them having to focus um, and be as on point as, pro as possible as actually producing the, the, the superb wines that they do every single year. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that there's any real influence on, on fashion at all. Uh, more so maybe on, on, the, on the champagne side of things where you have different fads with, with champagnes or the, the, the sort of celebrities drinking certain champagnes and that might put them in the, in the spotlight, the public eye. Um, and, but I think with the, the big hitting wines, they, they are really, really high and they, the, the kudos is there. They, they know where, where they are. Um, there's only a certain amount of people could afford to drink sort of your, 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 your Latours, say, for example, where they might be 500 pound within a restaurant, a thousand pound a bottle. There's only a, a, a small amount of, of the higher net worth sort of people that would be able to drink this sort of uh, these, these wines in, in your bars and restaurants. So I don't think there's much real influence I, I just think these 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 chateaus, these vineyards have set their stamp from day one. Um, you will get other chateaus that, that are up and coming through the ropes. Like you said, you, you have this, an influence maybe of Robert Parker, but Robert Parker can make or break a chateau. So, of course, if there's been mentions of, of certain wines, then maybe there was a, a, a little backhand or a brown envelope with a certain amount of money <laughs> that, was, that was given out to, to, to promote this, this, this new wine. But like I said, I think a lot of them have their stance already and that there isn't any real influence from elsewhere. If I was to approach you and say, uh, I'm interested in investing in investment grade wine, I like the idea, or in fine wine, I like the idea of you know, being able to drink some of it for free by selling the rest of it at some point what what would you tell me to do how would i should i put together a portfolio what should i be thinking about well i think because of the foundations of, of bordeaux and, and how well it's it's done over time we we predominantly say to a, a client a collector look let's let's focus 50 percent of of them funds over into the bordeaux not necessarily happens to be first growth wines there's some fantastic wines from sort of second growth wines uh even down to your fifth growth there's still some fantastic wines like ponte canet it's a fifth growth wine but in 2009 the ponte canet was given 100 points out of 100 by robert parker uh once again in 2010 and that they've shown good growth but they have now slowed down but they're the sort of wines where you might pick up a case for say sort of 17 1800 pound a case um and it gives us a bit of diversification we would say to a customer maybe focus sort of 10 percent of funds after that on on um burgundies 10 percent on rome there's some absolutely fantastic wines and sassicaia from from italy you've got some super tuscans uh italy sassicaia ornolaia um, they've done really, really well over the last few years. Like people have made fantastic growth, percentage growth. Um, but we just try to be as diverse as possible. We know that Bordeaux is, is, the, is the base, it's the foundation. So we'd probably focus 50% Bordeaux, 10% Champagne, 10% Rhone, 10% California. There's, like I said, some great Californian wines. Um, 
very quirky, different, but haven't shown us the growth that we would like to see as of yet. But we would recommend anyone look at even wine or whiskey, a sort of five year hold, a 10 year hold. It's not something where we don't see any fluctuation. You see, it's not where we have the global pandemic and there's billions of pounds wiped off the stock market. Suddenly, it's we, we, just, we just don't see any affiliation with, with global pandemics. If there's changing presidents or, and, and literally we, we have, it, it seems to be volatile. And I think that's what people like with, with investing or collecting in wine and whiskey, that it, it just literally stays it's steady. And the longer you hold, the better you're going to do. Um, we might show people sort of 5% growth one year, but 15, 20% growth on another year. It's very, very rarely if we, and I think it's something that we pride ourselves on between myself, Pat, and the guys at Elite Wine and Whiskey, where we don't rush into investing people's money. So if someone comes to us and says, look, this is how much I want to put into the market. This is, we, we, we work with the customer. So they have an interest in the products. They might give us an influence of where they want to put their money as well. It might be more whiskey based if they have some sort of influence or some family heritage or, or some background where they want to invest more in whiskey. But we would take our time and we always take our time making sure that the stock that we put any of our customers to, we know it's going to perform well over a certain amount of time, a certain amount of years. But we recommend sort of five year hold at least, uh, anywhere up to 10 really, if, if possible. Yes, yeah, same question to you. If if I was to approach you and say I want a I want to invest in whiskey, what what's what should I do? Should I build a portfolio and what should I be thinking about as I'm doing that? Um, you should 100 percent build a portfolio. The the main things to consider um, you want to be investing in a whiskey that is uh, predominantly owned by one or all of the the major international companies, Diageo. Bacardi, Pernod Ricard, somebody of that nature, that if they're putting all their money into that distillery, into that business, that's obviously a really good thing for your investment because they're going to see the uplift in the whiskey and the distillery that's going to represent an uplift in the cask that's going to outperform the standard year-on-year increase. Um, you would want a diversity in terms of the, the year expressions. So you, you might get a three-year-old cask, a five-year-old, a 10-year-old, a 15-year-old cask, um, so that then you can be getting different growth at different stages. And of course, if you were really wanting to expand upon that portfolio, you would also be wanting to look for uh, different cask expressions. So from refill bourbon to sherry to port, um, and then you basically take every single box. You know, you only want to be buying whiskies that you can see in every major supermarket or duty free um, across the world, um, because then you know you're really maximising it. There are uh, whiskies out there that are trade name spirit, so that is a secondary whisky that the distillery would produce. So Tomatin, for example, is, is the main name distillery. They'll produce a Tomatin whisky but they have a trade name spirit called Streth Earn, which is what goes out to blenders. And some, uh, some people are misguided or misknowingly invest into these trade name spirits without doing the research properly, um, and therefore are then with a cask, but there's no overall brand behind that particular cask. Um, and that's why it's really important to just invest into main name brand whiskies that you can see on the shelves um, and that you can Google and that you can see on websites like, you know, the Whiskey Exchange or Masters of Malt, the big main name players, and um, because that gives you the safety and security. You know, somebody else is working hard investing their billions and millions of pounds into building that brand, which you own a cask of. So let them do all the hard work for you whilst you just let it sit there and continue to mature into this wonderful, beautiful spirit. And if you did ever want to draw up a bottle from your cask, you can do that without affecting any part of your profit because your cask is sitting safely in a nice HMRC bonded warehouse with your unique cask number, which is the same as a license plate on a, on a car. So it's unique to you and you can get the, the warehouse keeper or, or somebody that works within the warehouse to draw off a bottle uh, of the whiskey from your cask. Um, obviously, if you do it when it's too young, it'll be at 60% ABV. So 
you know, it might destroy your taste part, your taste buds <laughs> and, and destroy your palate forever. Um, but as time goes on, or if you have a 15 year old cask, um, for example, you could you could draw off a bottle, they'll stick your name, your label, all the cask details on the bottle for you. And it can be sitting there, pride of place, you know, in, in your home, on your, on your drinks tray, your drinks cabinet, uh, sharing with your friends. And then a couple of years later, you can draw off another bottle and have a comparison. Um, as it's mellowed out a bit and more of the flavors from the cask have came into it. But that is, that's number one for me is you want a cask of whiskey from a main name brand distillery that you can see everywhere. Um, then followed by the different age expressions and then the different cask styles. And that gives you such a great level of, um, of potential growth and protection um, because we're, we're a big company doing all that hard work for you. Um, you know, you're you're just going to um, reap the rewards of that from from what they do. Uh, gents, uh, absolutely fascinating discussion. We're coming up on time. If folks are interested in learning more about wine or whiskey or getting in touch with you, what's the best way to go about doing that? So our website is www.elitewineandwhiskey.com. Um, our telephone number and all our uh, details, contact details are on there. We have a, a team of portfolio managers that are happy to, to answer uh, any questions. Um, if anyone ever wants to call in or, or speak to us and me and Pat were always at the, the other end of the uh, phone as well. So, and as you can tell from today's conversation, we, we enjoy drink, uh, drinking and talking <laughs> wine and whiskey. So if anyone ever wants to call us and they, they want any advice, then by all means, yeah, we, we're here. Well, that's fantastic. Thanks very much, Steve Bishop and Patrick Fisher from Elite Wine and Whiskey. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>